series starting today. So today, this morning, if you're new here, if it's only going to be your first time, we're going to kind of do an introduction um, sermon to the uh, series, Fruit of the Spirit, Experience Freedom. So Emily loved that picture. Does that look like a cool picture? Looks pretty cool, right? She's like, that just reminds me of the Spirit. I'm like, where's... It's the fruit of the Spirit. Where's the fruit? Like, I'm like kind of guy, old school thinking. It's like, you got to have like, you know, the banana and the apples. And she's like, no, this, and this is like, taste the rainbow, right? Skittles, sorry. I don't watch too much TV, but I definitely, I think growing up, I watched enough TV for a whole lifetime. So I still have all the old commercials. And every once in a while, you might hear a Seinfeld quote or something like that. So forgive me if that actually takes place, just walking in the flesh. But we're going to be starting um, Fruit of the Spirit, Galatians 5. So let's turn there this morning. Take a drink real quick. Good to see everyone here this morning. The real believers up in the house. It's a holiday weekend, and we're in church. Amen? Come on, somebody. If you could just be in prayer for me, I've been kind of like just in a fog all morning. And so uh, hopefully I'll be able to get out what I feel the Lord wants me to get out, but praise the Lord. So we're going to be in Galatians 5, 13 through 25, and if if you don't have a Bible with you, we're going to have it up on the screen this morning. But let's just read this. I'm going to read it out loud. For you are called to freedom, brethren, only do not turn your freedom into an opportunity for the flesh. But through love, serve one another. For the whole law is fulfilled in one word in the statement, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. But if you bite and devour one another, take care that you are not consumed by one another. But I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not carry out the desire of the flesh. For the flesh sets its desire against the Spirit, and the Spirit against the flesh. For these are in opposition to one another, so that you may not do the things that you please. But if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. Now the deeds of the flesh are evident, which are immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, outbursts of anger, disputes, dissensions, factions, envy, drunkenness, carousing, and things like these. Of which I forewarn you, just as I have forewarned you, that those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things there is no law. Now those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. If we live by the Spirit, let us also walk by the Spirit. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for our time here this morning already that that has been able to take place, just being able to be in your presence and and worship with our voices, with our bodies, with our hands. We thank you, Lord. We thank you for the freedom that can be found only in Christ Jesus. So I pray, Lord, that you would help me to be able to communicate what you've given me to share and that it would go down deep into our hearts, Lord, that we would all be hearers and doers of your word, Lord. We thank you and praise you for this time, and I pray, Lord, that you'd anoint all of us, Lord, to be the believers that you've called us to be, to live the lives that you've called us to live, Lord. We thank you so much for who you are and what you've done already, but we thank you, Lord, for where you're taking us and the life that is going to be lived, Lord, as we follow your leading and your guiding. We love you and praise you. In Jesus' name, amen. Like I already said, we're, we're starting our new series in Fruit of the Spirit this morning. And as I've been praying and studying, and I, I definitely feel that we've been, I've been being led to go into this series on Fruit of the Spirit. Something has, has been taking place in, in my life and in, in kind of my atmosphere, in my, I guess, uh, place of, of influence, I guess you could say. And I don't know if any of you guys have ever have ever felt something weird like this, but it almost feels like you're being set up. Has anybody ever been set up before? Hopefully not for a crime or anything like that. Um, If it was, don't don't think on that. But maybe maybe you were set up on on a blind date and you didn't know it before. I know some people, you know, you go out on blind dates and you know what you're getting yourself into, but maybe, maybe there's some here that, that have had that experience, maybe not. I know for many that maybe a dating scene happened a long time ago. 
but or, or you know, different areas where, where it could have been where all of a sudden you, you, you come to a place and you're like, does everybody know something that I don't know? Because something is weird, something's going on, you know, it's, it's just that feeling like the Truman Show, like everyone is watching me, like, you know, like you go, to, you go to the DMV or something. I remember when I first moved down to California, get my driver's license, people I knew that, that at my work, they're like, you know what, before you go to the DMV, you better make an appointment. Because down here, it might be a little bit different than the backwoods that you came from. Because you need an appointment. I'm like, okay, I'll get an appointment. It's like, cool, I'll just go in and, and kind of get a reservation, dinner reservation, whatever the case. But, you know, I mean, even though you get a dinner reservation at a certain time, you show up five minutes early, it still takes you like 20 minutes to get in, right? Well, the DMV was like 40 minutes. And it looked like I, I had a reservation, but there was hundreds of people there. And it's like, no one's doing anything, so why am I not getting served? But, but it reminded me of, of one thing that, you know, just being set up was one time when I, when I first moved down to California. And I started going to this other Foursquare church down there. And uh, I was there in, in their old building. They moved into a larger building that they built on their campus. And I started sitting in my, own, my same seat. Um, you know, it was like my seat. This is where I sat at. And it was a very multicultural um, congregation. And apparently, I didn't know this, because I felt right at home, but apparently I stuck out like a sore thumb. I was like the only white guy that was over six foot at this church. And so what took place is, is uh, I was sitting over, you know, over in my side, kind of like where Daryl and, and Norma are. It was a little bit farther. It was a little bit bigger building. And there was this other white couple, and they had two blonde daughters. And they used to always sit in the front row, and they were kind of on the prayer team. So they always helped out. And so I kind of noticed them, you know, because there was, there was a lot of different ethnicities in, the, in, this, in this church. And all of a sudden, I'm just kind of, you know, just going my routine of going to church and, you know, you know kind of like leaving the last song so I didn't have to say hi to anybody, doing that whole bit and getting there late and, and everything and just trying to shake hands. Well, all of a sudden, one Sunday, all, I, all of a sudden I noticed that the people, I, I'm, you might have heard this story before, but the people that used to sit front and center in the church all of a sudden were sitting directly in front of my seat. And they knew my seat. And, and it was the, directly the row. It wasn't like they sat in, in my seat, my row, or, you know, behind me. They sat directly in the row in front of me because I put my L right there. I didn't, but, but they ended up sitting right there. And, and, and so they would try and say hi to me all the time. They would say. They wouldn't try, but they would say hi to me all the time during the service, you know, kind of like we do, greet one another, everything like that. But after a while, I started saying, you know, you know what, this is a setup. Something's going on here that is fishy. Well, like I was saying, I, I've been feeling like I've been getting set. Eventually, I married the girl, so it was officially a setup. It was, it was Emily and her parents. So anyways, um, to kind of just long, you know, just an overview, Reader's Digest version of our relationship. But anyways, I feel like I've been set up by the Lord because as we go into the fruits of the Spirit, it seems like he's setting me up with more opportunities to walk in the fruit of the Spirit. And I don't know if you can kind of understand that. Usually when you hear being set up, it's kind of in a negative tone or a negative connotation where it's like, oh, man, this is, this is going to be terrible. Oh, man, this can't be good. And we kind of just like want to hold back and everything like that. But we need to know that God is wanting to set us up to be able to walk out with opportunities to walk out the fruit of the Spirit. And he wants to set us up for success. It's not setting us up for failure, but he wants to set us up with success and for success. And so as, as, as we go through this series, I don't want you guys to think, oh man, all of a sudden stuff is happening in my life. I believe the Lord is going to be setting you up to practice the fruit of the Spirit, setting you up for success, that you have more opportunity to walk in the fruit of the Spirit. Okay? Because usually we think, and, and you've probably heard speakers before, you've heard other believers, other sisters or brothers in Christ say, I don't pray for patience anymore because I know when I pray for patience, God's going to send some people that he knows that I don't like into my life in that season. My kids are going to act a fool. There's going to be hell in my house. All this stuff is going to take place. So I want you to just be prepared because God is going to do something in your life and he's going to be able to create more opportunities for you to walk in the fruit of of the Spirit. Amen? 
because I believe that he wants us, because I believe that there's a freedom in the fruit. And that's why I believe that, that we kind of came up with the name of Fruit of the Spirit, Experience Freedom, because it's, it's actually when we are able to walk in the Spirit, when we're able to walk in the fruit of the Spirit, that we'll truly be able to see freedom take place in our lives. Because so many times we go back to our old default setting of living in the old nature, in the old man, or old selfish habits, and all those other things that list that we need a concordance and a dictionary to really define what they actually mean. And so, and we go back to that way of the flesh. But that there's a warring that goes on inside of us, all as believers in Christ. And it's a warring of the Spirit, as we've called on the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, that He has placed His Spirit within us, but that we still also have that old nature within us. And it's warring inside of us all the time. Before we go to bed, and we're trying to put the kids down, and, and that's just something. It's, it's like so many of us have had kids, or we've been in close proximity to other people that have had kids, because just like the Bible says that kids, children, are a blessing. They're a gift from God. Amen? And God uses them as chosen vessels, a royal priesthood, to impact your life so that you can bear the fruit of the Spirit. That things go on in, their, in your life because of what your children are doing and what they're allowing or, or what they're not allowing. And we get them as a gift from God that they are a blessing so that we learn patience. So that we learn to agape love. So that we learn kindness and gentleness. And God is so good, he's so good, amen, that they get to be under your house, under your roof, you get to see him day in, day and night for a minimum of 18 years. And if you're really blessed, it's longer, <laughs> right? Because God is trying to develop and give you the opportunity to walk in the Spirit and walk in the fruit of the Spirit. Amen? So we need to know that he is setting us up for success. And something as I was studying and learning and from other people that are way older than me is the quicker you learn how to operate and walk and develop in the fruit of the Spirit, it seems like sometimes the testing is a little bit quicker because you're able to operate in it a lot quicker. How many know, how many here, maybe don't raise your hand, but maybe did, did summer school. Like you were taking the whole test, maybe you, you learned a little bit different and, you know, sometimes people give the public schools a negative rap, whatever the case may be. So, so they're just teaching to other people and you kind of got left behind in some ways that you had to keep taking tests a little bit longer than other kids, you know. How much is that in our life that it's like, man, I feel like I'm still in summer school from elementary Christianity, you know, what, whatever the case may be. But, but God is wanting to take us through tests so that we graduate and that we can move on to the next level and so that we can be able to live and walk in freedom instead of falling back into that old nature and or that old default setting of just Flying off, the, flying off the hammer, flying whatever, whatever, you know, flying on your broom, if it might be so, but just being able to walk in the Spirit and walk in the fruits of the Spirit. And just like any good parent, because God is a good God, amen, and just like any parent, they want to set their child up for success and with what they believe would equip them for a successful life. And so I believe that as we go through this, that God is wanting to set us up to be successful and fruitful Christians, not necessarily making more money, it, it, you know, it, but he's given us all spiritual blessings. So how can we obtain all those spiritual blessings that he has for us? And I believe that one of the major keys is being able to walk in the fruit of the Spirit, having it evident in our life, developing it. And we'll go through certain stages that I believe. And again, it's just going to be an overview. So we're not going to be going through the specifics, um, but it's kind of an intro. And then we're going to be going, starting in love next week. And love is amazing. Love is, is it, it's everything. It, it just encompasses everything that is good. So when you think of a successful Christian, who do you think of? This is a question that I kind of thought as I was studying and preparing, if you think of a successful Christian, who do you think of? Who is the first person that comes to mind when you kind of are able to kind of sit back and think about that? Who, who, who would that be? Let me just take a, a quick drink real quick. I was kind of reading over this with Emily, and as I was kind of reading through this section, I was reading through it, and she's like, oh, that's who I was thinking about. It's like, you can't say I was thinking about that and not say it verbally. It's like, no, no, it doesn't work like that, right? 
Anyways, it's just like the difference. She thinks something is going to go on sale greater than it's on a sale. And I'm like, no, it's going to go back to the original price. How can it go on sale, sale? How can you go on, how can pencils be on clearance? Everyone's always going to be using, always going to be using pencils, right? So if it's a, if it's a back to school sale, why is the same pencil going to go back that was on sale, go to clearance all of a sudden? No, it's going to go to the back to the original price. Are you not a consumer? Come on, seriously. Anyways, I'm just saying. That's, that was our little discussion, if you guys didn't hear it. Anyways, help me, Lord. I need the fruit of the Spirit in my life. So I hope that you guys are praying for me, because I'm praying for you guys to receive it as well. But what about, so who was the most successful Christian that has ever lived? And I believe from whom the word Christian is derived from. What about Christ Jesus himself? We know that he did many uh, amazing miracles and feats in his life. But what do you believe was, one of the, was the most influential act that he did? It was dying on the cross. It was dying on the cross because he didn't deserve it. But he died the death of a thief, of a sinner, of a, of a wretch, of a wicked person. Not because he deserved it, but he did it for each and every one of us. He did it for you and I. And it's through that selfless act of love, of him dying upon the cross, taking upon our sins, so that we could live in freedom. And I believe one thing, which it's not really in my notes, but I hope throughout each each lesson and each time we talk about that, that we would see that because... The fruit of the Spirit cannot be developed if it is not in community, if it's not for one another, because all the commandments are summed up in that. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and loving your neighbor as yourself. If you're truly able to walk in that, then it surpasses the law, right? And so how can we truly walk in a Christ-like attitude, in Christ-like attributes and traits so that we can truly develop the fruit and that love in our lives because we know that God is within us. But he allowed it. He allowed it to happen to him so that the guilty parties, you and I, could be set free and be forgiven. That he has set us up for success. When we are to look and ponder and meditate on the fruit of the Spirit, we should look no further than Christ himself. It's said, many people, some theologians say that he is the personification of God. That Jesus put a face on God, and he he was and still is the physical and visual display of God. That these traits that describe the fruit of the Spirit are the traits that describe the Christ-likeness that not only he lived with, but we as believers are to follow and develop and cultivate in our own lives in a daily daily routine, in daily. We are to display Jesus to the world around us and in the communities and in all the peoples at our jobs and our workplaces. Wherever we come into contact with other people, we are supposed to be Christ to them. We are to have the development of the fruits of the Spirit so that they can partake of it, just like we were able to partake of Christ and of his fruit and enter into a freedom. So like I was saying before, I felt like the Lord was setting me up for success in the fact that he was and still is allowing me the opportunity to practice walking in the Spirit. So, just like I said before, that our children play a huge part. And sometimes we might not have children. Maybe our children are moved out. But God is always allowing us opportunity, whether it be a boss that we have in the workplace. Maybe it might be a spouse that is, that is trying your last nerve. Right? I mean, we could just preach on that. The re- I mean, even if you're not married, it's like, I have some friends. I know what you're saying. But there's, there's so much that needs to be implemented in our lives so that we can walk in the fruit of the Spirit. So what is the fruit of the Spirit? Let's look again. Galatians 5, 22 through 23. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. I sometimes just like information. I don't know if it really means anything. I'm sure there's some deeper meaning into this. But as I was studying, something... I learned something that I never knew before. And that is, there's not nine different fruits. It's singular. There's only one fruit. And the words, the nine words, are just, are just kind of uh, words that describe the traits 
of the fruit of the Spirit. And so it's, it's saying if it was, it was plural, it would say either the fruits or fruit. I mean, you see a bowl of fruit and it's filled up. But it would be fruit of the Spirit are love, joy. And so it's actually is. And so when you partake of God's fruit of the Spirit, you're, you should be able to partake of whatever is there, whatever is there, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, self-control, faithfulness. I don't know if, that's, if that was the whole, I have it right here, but I'm trying to memorize it. So hopefully by the time of our series, I'll be able to have that memorized. But it's, 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 it's being able to kind of see the many facets of the fruit of the Spirit that can be and are there for us to partake of and start to implement and plant the seeds in our own life. So it is the nature and character of God that can be given to humanity. With God, there are, there are two different types of attributes. Forgive me if I spit on anybody while saying these words, but there's the communicable and incommunicable attributes of God. Many of you guys have maybe heard of communicable before. Usually you've heard it with a disease, right? Communicable disease, like highly contagious. So hopefully, if you have one of those, you can just slip out the door, slip out the side, whatever the case may be, and we'll see you next week. But those are kind of the attributes that can be passed on from God, who is divinity, to humanity. Okay, the incommunicable um, attributes of God, you know, omnipresent, omniscient. Um, he's all powerful, all knowing. He's he's everywhere at once. But but the fruit of the spirit are his it are parts of his communicable characteristics that they're divine characteristics that he can bestow and grant and give to believers. Um, and so I believe that that is it. But that's not the only. That's not all of them. There's there's many more. But this is the study on the fruit of the Spirit. So when we are bearing the fruit of the Spirit, we are bearing the Christ-likeness of God. So with that being said, we need to know we cannot produce or make the fruit grow in our lives. The fruit, the traits of Christ, is not made by natural man, but they are produced by the Spirit of God. They are something that God can allocate or disperse to us as believers, kind of like a fund, like he can disperse it into our fund, into our bank account. Amen? Because we are deficient in it. So how do we get them, or how do we receive them? John 15, 4-5 says, Abide in me, and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me, and I in him, bears much fruit. For without me you can do nothing. So we see a branch cannot bear fruit of itself. So is a Christian. We cannot bear fruit by ourselves, the fruit of the Spirit, without being a part of the branch, without being a part of Christ, without being a part of Him and His body. And it's also, it's abiding in Him and Him in us. So we know that as a believer, when we call on the name of the Lord Jesus, that He gives us His Spirit. He imparts His Spirit into us. But I believe not every, not every believer that has the Spirit is in the Spirit. So we can be a believer, we can have the Spirit, but we're not actually in the Spirit. So we don't have the fruit of the Spirit. Amen? If you believe that, you might not. But that's what I believe. Because if I abide in Him and He in me, so there's, there's a couple things going on that it's, okay, I believe in the Lord a Savior, but am I abiding in Him on a daily basis? Am I spending time with Him? Am I kind of reserving alone time with Him, spending time in His Word, spending time in prayer, spending time in worship and in fellowship? Am I spending time in God and in His presence, allowing Him to say what He needs to say to me? Or is it just like we talked about last week, prayer? Is it just a one-way, is prayer just a one-way? Is our life, do we think our Christian life is just a one-way street where we're just going to ask God, tell God, do this? But are we really allowing Him to speak into our life and allowing Him to have a say-so and Him to actually be Lord, because it's enter into the joy of your master. My peace I give to you. He gives us the fruit. He gives it to us, but it's, are we really serving him? Are we really following after him, allowing our master, allowing the Lord to speak and to have a rightful say in our lives of things, of areas that are of the flesh and be able to cut them? And it says in this scripture to crucify the flesh and not walk in the flesh because he gives us that if we are abiding in Him, if we are abiding in the Spirit. So see, God wants to pass on His seed, His nature that can be passed down to us as humanity so that we can bear His image. 
And so when a male and female, we know that, th that there's intimacy that needs to take place with us and God. And just like when intimate times take place before, between a man and a woman, close your, close, your, close your ears, bud. But I'm just joking. But anyways, if there's a fertile environment, there's a seed that's passed on, and all of a sudden, you know, nine months later, nine, I just played. <laughs> nine months later, you know, you're passing out cigars, right? Same with, same with God, with the Holy Spirit. He's trying to fertilize us. He's trying to make a fertile environment so that the seed of God hit through his spirit can be implanted in our hearts and we can reap, and that we can develop the fruit of the spirit. And so Luke 13, 6 through 9 says, he also spoke this parable. I had to throw in a parable. We just got done going through the summer of parables, so I just had to throw one in there. So it says, a certain man had a fig tree planted in his vineyard and he came seeking fruit on it and found none. Then he said to the keeper of his vineyard, look, for three years I have come seeking fruit on this fig tree and find none. Cut it down. Why does it use up the ground? But he answered and said to him, sir, let it alone this year also until I dig around it and fertilize it. And if it bears fruit, well, but if not, after that, you can cut it down. See, God is so relentlessly pursuing each and every one of us. He is so committed to each and every one of us. The Bible says that he's not willing that any should perish, but all should come to repentance. That, there's all, that we all need to come to a changing of mind and a changing of attitude and a changing of lifestyle, a repentance, so that we can come after and follow him. And he's allowing the Holy Spirit to kind of ruminate and kind of go around us and circulate and kind of fertile fertilize the atmosphere if we allow him to so that the seeds of righteousness that the seeds would be planted in our lives and so that they would bear fruit but we need to know that we need to believe that as believers and as followers of christ that he is pursuing us relentlessly that everything he does is relentless that that's why we see you can see the the, the fruit of the spirit that it's not just love but it's relentless love it's relentless joy it's relentless peace that he wants to give each and every one of us as believers and he will not sleep he will not not tire unless until we all are able to come into that fullness that he wants it so passionate for us and for each and every one of us in our lives amen that he loves us so much that the song that we've sung many times is he's a good father that he is good he is good all the time he's not going to stop being good and in that goodness and in that that fatherhood and attitude that he loves us so much that he wants he doesn't want to give up on us just like many of us don't want to give up on our kids but we're going to be there for them even when they make mistakes, dumb mistakes, do stupid stuff. How many of us have done stupid stuff in our life? How many of us are still doing stupid stuff in our life? And we know that God is going to be there for us because he's relentlessly pursuing us. And so the Holy Spirit wants to make us fertile as we are able to abide in him and spend time with him and have fellowship with him so that we would be able to produce and develop the fruit. So the next point I have is fruit is developed. It's not given. There's cultivation that needs to take place. There's sowing of seeds that needs to be done. There's watering that we know that, that we live in an agricultural area that fruit takes time. The fruit of the harvest takes time. That there's seasons that we go through. And I think many times as, as, as believers and as, as Christ's followers, we can be more engaged and more focused on the gift that is given a believer, than actually the fruit that is to be developed in a believer's life. That we see someone operating in their gift and they find, found out how to, how to operate and how to kind of tune it in or hone that skill in that God has given. We need to know that a gift is given, that the giftings and calling of God are irrevocable. And so that we can operate in that. That's why you see so many people in, in business, so many, so many musicians in, in our world, that they are gifted. God's gifted each and every one of us. But that there are things that, that, that we need to be able to see the fruit that is developed in a Christian's life. There was one older minister, I think he's passed away now, but he's like, if I, if I want to see that God is truly moving in someone's life, if I want to see that, that he is a true believer and that he, is, he has a fruitful life and that, or that, that God is doing a mighty thing in his life, I don't go to a church to see him. I go to his house right? That we can be so caught up with the gift and not take time to see if they have the fruit in their life. That's why we see so many times great men and women of God that, that are doing awesome feats, amazing things for God, and then all of a sudden all hell breaks loose and we find out that they're doing some crazy lifestyle. 
Because they have the gift, they know how to operate in the gift that's been given, but there hasn't been fruit developed. They don't have the character yet to kind of continue them on in that course of that God has for them. There's something that kind of popped up into me is, is with the, uh, the garment. If you don't know the Old Testament, that, that, that priest, he was the first, he was the, Aaron was the first priest, the high priest. And as the high priest, they were supposed to go into the Holy of Holies and kind of worship and to, to offer the sacrifice upon the altar, upon the mercy seat. And so on the garment, on the hem of the garment, there was pomegranates and a bell, pomegranates and a bell, all the way around. It wasn't just a bunch of bells, and it wasn't just a bunch of pomegranates. And what I've believed and I, I, I have heard, I've heard it taught is, just like, just like um, 1 Corinthians 13, about if, if I am able to do all these mighty things for God, but have not love, I'm a, but a clanging symbol, I'm but a noise, I'm making just a bunch of noise to God. But God wants there to be just amount as gift as there is fruit in our lives, so that we can truly operate and be the royal priesthood that he calls us to, so that we would have some fruit and we would have our giftings. We would have fruit and we would have our giftings, so that we can truly operate in who God has called us to as believers. So that is the true sign, I believe, that God is moving in someone's life is when there is fruit developed, not just seeing that they know how to operate in a gift that God has given. Because God gives it. He gives it to people. He doesn't want it back. There's some people that want it back. And I, I'm not... It's, just, it's funny. You can't, you can't, you, you're not supposed to say certain things, right? Like, we're on a reservation. You're not supposed to... Anyways... You guys don't get the joke. <laughs> Sorry. To kind of continue on that, on a side note, Emily was, just take a little, uh, a little break, sorry, a commercial break. Emily was talking with someone at school today, and uh, they're a white couple, and her husband just got a job with the tribe working at the casino. So he was kind of talking with his HR rep and going over the certain benefits that he's going through. So he was kind of like looking at the, you know, the paid holiday list and all this kind of stuff, and he's looking, he's like, do we get Columbus Day off? And I'm like, he did not ask that. And she, I, apparently she let him know about American history, and he will not be asking that question again as long as he works for the tribe. So I was just like, he did not. Like, are you serious? Anyways, back from that commercial break. Where was I? Did I read Matthew 7? Okay, Matthew 7, 21 through 23. Not everyone who says to me, I'm foggy, I've told you guys, you guys aren't praying hard enough. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father in heaven. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name, cast out demons in your name, and done many wonders in your name? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. So it says that he never knew them. The reason why it says that he never knew them is because he couldn't see himself in them. He couldn't see the Christ likeness. He couldn't see the fruit developed in their life. Sure, they had the gifts. Sure, they were able to be able to do amazing things, cast out demons. I mean, who doesn't want to be able to cast out demons and, and perform miracles and do all these great feats? But that's not really what God is looking for. God is looking for fruit in our lives. The development of fruit. To be a successful Fruitful Christian, it doesn't all weigh on the giftings that God has placed inside of us, but it's the fruit that has been developed in our life from spending time with our Heavenly Father, times of intimacy, times of fellowship, abiding in Him and He in us, times of giving away and blocking out of the day, just practical things, being able to shut stuff off, shut the busyness of life off, getting in your calendar, waking up early, going to bed a little bit later, whatever you can do during a lunch break, go out to your car. I know sometimes I had to go out to my car during work, but you just have to find sometimes when life is so chaotic, you have to make yourself take time out of your busy day, turn off your phone, turn off your device, get off of Facebook, whatever it might be, when you finally find a moment to have and be able to have time to be able to spend in his presence. Take that time. And it's not just the, you know, a couple minutes, but it, it can develop into something, into a lifestyle. I remember someone, uh, Smith Wigglesworth, I think it was, old Pentecostal guy, I think in England or, or Scotland or something like that. I mean, he did some crazy stuff. But someone asked him, he's like, how much, how much do you pray? How, how, much, how long do you pray for? He's like, he's like, I don't pray for more than 10 minutes. And like, a pers apparently the person was like, what, are you kidding me? 
only 10 minutes. He's like, but I don't go 10 minutes without praying. He's like, my, my day is, is, is praying without ceasing. I continually spend time with God. Are we able to kind of have that mentality and have that discipline that even we're at work and doing our job, what we're supposed to be doing, are we able to kind of still engage into the spirit and, and know that God is with us? He never leaves us nor forsake us. It's not that we leave our house and we clock in at work, then all of a sudden God isn't there. But God is there with us. He's within us. And that we can take that time on breaks to just be able to spend time with him in prayer and in fellowship and even in worship. So it's, it's also, it's times of being with other mature believers. The fruit comes by being, it's times of being with other mature believers. Not just people that have been Christians a while, but those that you have been able to see the fruit developed in their lives. When you have peace, the atmosphere of police, peace collides with a person that might be living and having an atmosphere of chaos in their life. And when that collisions of those two atmospheres take place, there is able to be something that takes place of an allocation. Either that person can be able to receive the peace of the atmosphere that has been developed in your life, or we can default, like I said earlier, we can default and start being engaged to what the, the, the atmosphere that they're living in. We can allow their chaos to enter our peace and it ruin us. Or we can be able to allow our peace to infiltrate their chaos. I know many times that I, that, that I heard um, of people kind of saying that whenever they go to my parents' house, that it's like they can just take a breath off. They can just take a breath, that there's a load that, that, it, that it seems like it's been lifted off because of, of the peace that has been just an atmosphere that they've been able to kind of have in that, in that house. And I know that it's kind of been a refuge for them, that place that they've been able to just pray all the time, pray in the spirit and be able to just, just do beautiful things with their yard. But, but we as believers need to have that so that we can be those people that have the fruits developed so that if someone is, 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 is living or is, has an atmosphere of chaos or some type of struggle that's going on, that they can come into contact with us as mature believers, so that they can partake of that fruit. Amen? Instead of, instead of going off into that chaos and, and allowing that same situation or that same circumstance that would somehow set us off and cause Mount Vesuvius to erupt or Mount St. Helens to erupt, once again, we can partake of the fruit because it's there for us to partake of. The Bible says that where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. That wherever we are, there is the Spirit of the Lord. And if we engage in Him, that we are able to receive that freedom that's within Him. So freedom can come by bearing and developing fruit. Galatians 5.13 says, For you were called to freedom, brethren, only do not turn your freedom into an opportunity for the flesh, but through love serve one another. Besides my parents' example, my parents an illustration, an example kind of my own life. I was going through something down when I was living down in San Diego and it just kind of chaos. I had made some dumb decisions and uh, it was kind of in, in the storm. You know what I mean? It's like, it's like Christianese, you know, I'm in the storm. I am in the midst of the storm. And so there was some storm that was going on in my life and I was just like, oh man, what do I do? All this kind of, I was getting sick. Everything was taking place. And so something finally happened to where my pastor heard about it and I mean, usually Mondays is Pastor's Day off, and, and it was a larger church. So I got a phone call on Monday, and he's like, I heard you're going through some stuff. I'd like to meet with you. So I knew it was, like, big, big time beneficial for him to meet with me. He wanted to. And I just knew that was a big, like, wow, cool. So I took the day off from work, and I met with him. And all of a sudden, he, he opened with prayer, and we just kind of, I just started to pour out my heart and what I was going through. And as I was doing that, it just seemed like the whole atmosphere shifted in that whole office. And all of a sudden, there was a peace that the Bible says surpasses all understanding, that there was a peace that all of a sudden just overwhelmed me. And there was a calming that happened in my heart and in my spirit that, that you, just, you, you just can't explain unless you experience it. And he began to give me wise counsel and kind of just go through the different areas. Well, if this happens, you know, this is probably what's going to happen. If this, choose this, this is going to take place. And so after I left that, I had the choice to kind of go back into the worry and back into the chaos and back into the strife mentality, or I could continue to choose to walk in that peace. And see, that is what God is wanting for us, that as we come into contact with other believers, mature believers, that, that there is fruit developed in their life. So what are they fruitful and what, is, what do they have that maybe you can see and kind of 
be engaged with them and, and be imparted to you the seeds because it's not like you're just going to get patience. It's not like you're just going to get gentleness or kindness overnight. It needs to be developed. But what are some areas that you know that, that you're struggling in or that you're deficient in that needs to be developed? Because it's through community that that takes place as well. It's by being in the Spirit, by abiding in Christ, and being in fellowship, being in community, because we're all here for one another. It's through serving, through ministering through, to one another in love. It's all through love. Galatians 5, 16, 22 through 25 says, But I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not carry out the desire of the flesh. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such there is no law. Now those who belong to, the, to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. If we live by the Spirit, let us also walk by the Spirit. So our charge as believers is to walk in the Spirit. But that is what he's calling us and asking us to do. Paul is, is inspired by the Holy Spirit to charge believers, to charge the church of Galatia, to charge the church of Christ, to walk in freedom. That's what the whole book is about. It's about walking in freedom. But just like I said last week, to walk in freedom and to walk in the Spirit that you need to know whose you are. Are you Christ? I would like to take communion, start passing out communion at this time if we can. But this verse says that those who are Christ, so do we know that we are Christ? Have we made the decision to follow after Christ, that we've given him our all, that we've given him our heart, that we've called on the name of the Lord Jesus Christ? It says that we shall be saved. But it says that those who are Christ have crucified the flesh with its passion. Jesus Christ died to the flesh so that we can live in freedom. That there is a freedom that he gives to us as believers. That he died the death of, of the cross through crucifixion. And I know that maybe many of you guys have heard about crucifixion and the cross. What happens is that when a person is hung upon the cross, that they are struggling the whole time to get breath, to get air. And as the day goes on, that their muscles begin to atrophy, their muscles begin to get weak and begin to droop, and all of a sudden their whole body begins to droop so that the death that they die is from suffocation or asphyxiation. And this scripture says that those who are Christ have crucified the flesh with its passion and desires. So those who are Christ are those who have suffocated the flesh no longer giving it air or breath or a say in their life. Your life is a direct reflection of who you listen to. We are the sum total of the voices that we allow into our life. So I want to ask you, how, you, how are you living your life today? What and who are you giving your life to? Is it the Spirit of God? Or is it maybe to others around you? Or maybe it could be the, one of the worst enemies of all. Because the enemy in you and the enemy in me, our flesh, giving in to the flesh. I want to leave us with one more thought this morning before we partake. 1 Corinthians 10, 13, it says, No temptation has overtaken you except such as is common to man. But God is faithful who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able, but with the temptation will also make the way of escape that you may be able to bear it. When we are going through something, when there's a negative in their life, that is a telltale sign that there's a supernatural ability or a supernatural resource that God is trying to allocate to us, to pour into us so that we would partake of it and be able to bear it in our lives knowing that we are going to go through trials and tribulations and circumstances and chaos. But with everything that comes upon us, whatever evil might befall us, just like with Joseph, the scripture that many of us know, what they meant for evil, God can turn around for good. In the negative situation that you might be in right now, God is trying to allocate or show you a resource that you can partake of and start to plan in your life not so that you can get out of it because he's still going to be there in the midst of the storm with you 
but he wants to give you the resource so that you can walk with your head held high and be able to get through it knowing that he is with you that he's never going to leave you nor forsake you God is wanting to make a way where there seems to be no way and even though there might be some negative opposition in our life that he's wanting to grant us favor, that he's wanting to bestow grace in our lives so that we can break free of the bonds that hold us down. Instead of falling back into the bottle or falling back into an attitude or a mindset, he's wanting to fall into his grace and into his arms and into his fruit instead of the old nature. My son Luke, he's almost 16 months now and he is yet to walk. He's a late bloomer like his dad. But he's taken one step. But I remember with my other girls, when they were beginning to walk, when they would fall, I wouldn't run over to them, stand above them, and yell at them, say, get up, what are you doing? Come on, walk. No, I pick them up, hug them, wipe off their tears. Even if they bruise themselves, or even worse, I'd pick them up and have them do it again, have them try it again. Too often, some of us have the mentality that God is standing over us, waiting for us to screw up and fall so that he can yell at us, throw down the gavel and say, tear out that tree. But God is relentlessly pursuing each and every one of you, all of us. And he wants to pick us up when we fall and dust us off and wrap his arms in grace around us and encourage us to take a step again because we're all going to fall sooner or later. And we have the bruises if we allow other people to see it in our lives that show the times that we've fallen. But God wants to pick us back up and to set us up back up on our feet to begin to walk in the Spirit. So as we partake of communion, I want to have you guys open your hearts up to receive what God is saying to you of areas that might be deficient of the fruit of the Spirit. Maybe some areas that you've fallen and you haven't gotten back up, but you're still lying on the ground. Maybe even you feel like you need to come forward for prayer before you even partake of communion because you don't want to do it in an unworthy manner. But I believe you can do business with yourself there also. Let us be mindful of the Spirit so that we can abide in Him and He in us and walk in the Spirit and develop the Spirit in our lives. Amen. That we would be a church that experiences freedom by by developing the fruit of the Spirit. So as we go into this song, let's partake of communion together.